that includes, and that includes the footprint manufacturer, the exporter, the association of Bangladesh, a mouthful, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank SLTC for giving me this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the Bangladesh leather industry. Uh, the presentation will start with, obviously, a uh, little bit of a snapshot of the country, uh, the position that the leather industry occupies in our nation, um, some of the reasons that we are in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and then also maybe talk about some of the steps going forward. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my country. Uh, Bangladesh is a country half the size of New York State with 152 million people. So it's a little crowded. Uh, if you like wide open spaces, it's not for you. We're also a very young population. We have almost 50 million people out of 152 million who are, as you can see, between the ages of 10 to 24 years. Why is that important? It's important because of the demographic dividend. Uh, this population is, a, is in its prime working years. Uh, we have a manufacturing opportunity for the next 15 to 25 years. And as many of you probably know, we also have about 35% of our population below the poverty level. That's defined currently at living on an income of less than two US dollars a day. Having said that, we also have a few good things going for us. Uh, Dr. Yunus, who is uh, our pride, and as you know, the Nobel Prize winning laureate and founder of the Grameen Bank, the microcredit financing um, innovation in the world, came up with the term Chindia. Bangladesh is the only country that's right next to Chindia, the two fastest growing economies in the world. We're smack right in between. Um, we've averaged about 6% GDP growth for the last decade or so. And thanks to about 200 years of British occupation, we speak reasonable English, which is an advantage in today's world. If you look at where leather is uh, in the world and what Bangladesh is doing, we're just about 3% of global output by volume, not by value. 95% of what we make is destined for export, uh, about 200 million square feet of which 80% of the leather is exported. Where does it go? Mainly to Europe, Brazil, Japan, China, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Mainly to shoe factories, leather bag factories, and some um, upholstery makers around the world. If you look at the industry, it's characterized by a lot of small firms. We have more than 3,500 firms working in the industry, of which 100 are categorized as large firms. We have 220 registered tanneries, of which 90% are in one area alone, called the Zariba, which is uh, the unfortunate pictures that you saw in the morning, which is true, by the way. We provide direct employment for almost 200,000 people and indirect employment for almost 700,000 people. And there are more than 2,500 small shoe factories just in Dhaka City. These are mainly working for the local industry. Over 30 large export shoe factories in Bangladesh. These include Hao Chen, Stella, Green, and some of the biggest people in the world who are now resourcing or relocating production out of Vietnam and China into our country. This has attracted attention from some of the biggest buyers in the world, whether it's Picard, which is a third generation German leather brand, Bass, Hugoboss, Timberland, Armani, they're all sourcing already from Bangladesh. And the natural advantage is the raw material. We have a home to about 2% of the global cow population, almost 4% of the global goat population. The animal supply, as I've already said, is about 300 million square feet. And only less than 20% is actually needed for the domestic market because of low purchasing power. Most of the food grade in Bangladesh is still predominantly synthetic rubber, what we like to call um, flip flops. Now, why is the leather industry so important for Bangladesh? Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about Bangladesh or who don't, 80% of Bangladesh's exports come from one sector and one sector alone. That's the apparel industry. So, textile and apparel accounts for almost 80% of our total exports. That makes us very much a one-trip pony, which is very dangerous for a country that's about to emerge out of its developing states. Uh, as a result, the government and industry are very keen to develop other sectors to try and reduce our dependence on garments and apparel. Export of leather goods, which includes footwear, experienced exponential growth, almost 50%, albeit from a very low base, and it's categorized and prioritized as a priority sector for three major reasons. 
high value addition instead of selling an only sell product. Uh, export diversification, as I just talked about, and of course, the most important is job creation for our young population. But we have two serious challenges, as you know about. First and foremost is the environmental disaster that is called Zaiwa, which is the area where the cannabis have traditionally grown up. And of course, coming along with that hand in hand is the increased emphasis on sustainability, not only by international buyers, as like I said, but also from within the country. This unfortunately is the state of the industry and has been for almost three decades. Around 200 calories disgorging our refuge and our, our output right into this river called the Burigon. Um, there's almost 15,000 metric tons of effluent during the peak time and about 9,000 metric tons during the off peak period, having successfully destroyed the ecosystem in that river. To understand why this happened, I need to share with you a little bit about the chronology of why the industry came off in Zaria and how the industry has actually grown. The tanning industry in Bangladesh actually goes back to pre-Bangladesh, in fact pre-India time when India was still part of the British Raj. In 1940, believe it or not, the leather processing industry began in Bengal. 1949 was the establishment of the first leather college in Zaria. And as you can see, slowly the move into cross feather production and then, of course, from 86, you see the movement of the government trying to put pressure on the factories. If you see in 1986, out of the 903 factories, about 200 of them were actually tanneries, and 700 of the rest were other factories, starting to be pressurized and asked to clean up. 1990, the industry moves into finished leather. 1991, there is a ban of wet blue. And in 2001, the High Court orders the government of Bangladesh and the factories to act within one year or face contempt charges. 2002, finally, the government acts and it finalizes the site for the relocation of the tannery industry, which we refer to as TED, the tannery estate of Dhaka. But then, why was Zariba originally chosen? For very four simple reasons. First, 1940, it was the wilderness. It was outside the city limits, there was no inhabitation. Uh, it was near a river, and traditional wisdom in those days was discharge into the river. If you go to Santa Croce and see what the tannery industry did to Arno, the river Arno, we know how that all happened. The same story happened in Azariba with the Burigong. It was uninhabited, there was no, industry, there was no uh, residential properties there, and it was actually designated as an industrial area in 1940. It was not intended for human habitation. But then, why did it become unsustainable? First, the number of tanneries grew exponentially. As you know, maybe possibly some of you do know, up till 1971, Bangladesh was part of Pakistan and we were called East Pakistan. And while we were part of Pakistan, most of the factories, in fact most of the industry was actually owned by people from West Pakistan. When we became independent, after a nine month civil uh, independence war, where we lost three million people in that war, these West Pakistani owners obviously left the country. And most of these factories got national, nationalized. And after independence, the government took over in a, in a spirit of nationalization these abandoned properties and started to sell these abandoned industrial plots indiscriminately. At the same time, Dhaka began to grow, and Hazaribad became actually an extension of an area called Dhanuni, which is a prime residential zone in Dhaka. Many of the new owners who bought these lands began to use these lands illegally for residential purposes. Believe it or not, even today, there is no official residential permit, residential zoning permission given for housing in the Hazarda area. It is still officially designated as an industrial zone. <laughs> Unfortunately, <coughs> implementation and enforcement of regulation is very poor in Bangladesh and people have been getting over it. But it doesn't take away from the fact that Hazaribad is an environmental disaster. <coughs> what happened? What, where did the new impetus come for us to get our act together? Part of it can be tracked back to actually the Earth Senate Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. The world came up with this whole sustainable development paradigm. It was no longer about exports at any cost. It was no longer about job creation at any cost. It was also about sustainability. Sustainability from a social point of view, from an environmental point of view. And if you look at the coincidence of the founding of really a the true activist environmental agency in Bangladesh, not even with the government, it's called Bela, 
the Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, founded by this great visionary called Dr. Mohyuddin Farooq, who was an environmental engineer by training. He took up this, this cause, and from 1992, we saw the beginning of this environmental activism, activism from within the country. The great cleanup, as we like to call it, has been attempted many times in Bangladesh. 1990, UNIDO recommended a treatment plant inside the Zaria. They said we don't need to go out, we can fix it. There were various court orders, there were initiatives to establish what we call a central effluent treatment plant, but it didn't work because A, Hazarima is extremely space constrained, and I think more importantly, most of the tannery owners <coughs> are still not able to understand the significance of the damage that we were doing in that area. From 1990, biopressure did increase, but it changed the mindset of some industry leaders. By and large, industry believed that they could continue to go get away with it. And finally, in 2003, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh issued a court verdict to relocate the industries outside of Azariba to tech. That is not to say nothing happened. If you look at what the UNIDO pro project did achieve, um, there were some small incremental steps in terms of reducing the environmental impact, whether it was the reduction of the COD, whether it was reduction of chrome, chrome in the wastewater, or even overall reduction of water usage in the industry. You know, they did make some small, small changes, but overall the industry continued to be environmentally unsustainable. So the answer was, and the answer is, what we like to call TED, and this again through government procurement and tendering procedures has been delayed for a long time, but finally we believe that 205 plots, uh, 200 acres of land, and 155 new industrial units comprising of new tanneries will come into operation by 2016. What are some of the features and facilities in TED? We have a central dumping yard, we have a water treatment plant with a capacity of 22.8 million liters per day, we have a sludge power generation system, we have a common chrome recovery unit, and a sewage treatment plant with a capacity of 5 mm per day. But then, why did it take so long? Everybody who talks about the Zaribak says it took too long. Um, there's a myriad of reasons, and I'm not going to try to list all of them, but I think part of it is to do also with the complexity of government procurement in Bangladesh, of trying to get government to implement some of these decisions that they take. The first four tenders were designed in such a way they were targeted to award the tender to just one bidder. As a result, nobody actually participated, and when there was no bidders, it was actually cancelled. After the fourth tender, the government was forced to award the contract to one of the two bidders. Immediately after losing the tender, the losing company filed the case against the government, thereby tying us up in litigation for another six years. Um, compensation, huge issues. How do you compensate tanneries for lost production, shifting, <coughs> the lack of coordination amongst the government, the donors, and the tanneries. Another brilliant example of government inefficiency at its best was how the financing issue came up of how that CETP was actually going to be financed. In its original wisdom, government had said, polluter pay principles apply, which is universal, but government would actually pay for the CETP and then charge tanneries for how much they would use or discharge into the system. Change of government, new government comes in and says, no, by the way, now we've decided industry needs to pay for the CETP. Oh, and by the way, it costs have gone up five times. And you have to pay for it. Obviously, this didn't go down very well with industry, another five years ago. Finally, financial resolution on the compensation issue. That was a huge, huge deal breaker. And finally, when that was resolved, we start to see the new impetus for why this is going forward. Today, this is a real picture taken one week ago on site. As I've said, the cameras in the government of Bangladesh have signed an MOU to ensure relocation on 13 October 2013. And the target date is June 2015. I believe they will be late by at least one year. But I personally believe by 2016, end of 2016, this will get done. Hazariwak tanneries, 10 tanneries. These are real pictures taken from site. Uh, there is no need to explain Hazariwak pictures, but if we show you what's being built in TED, I think there is reason to believe that we are on the right track, finally. The construction at the CETP site will continue 16 hours a day. There is a Chinese contractor that has the experience of setting up three ETP plants for the tanning industry in China working on this project. The substation is completed, the water treatment plant is established, gas plants have been done, and the rest of the construction is again, as I said, 
estimated to be completed by the end of 2015. Now, other than the environment, there are some other challenges within the Bangladesh leather industry. First and foremost is what I like to call weak market power. Most of the tanneries in Bangladesh continue to sell crust. It's very hard for us to actually have bargaining power or actually be able to engage with customers when all you're doing is selling a commodity, which is still cross sell. There is very low value addition. Uh, there is very low product development capacity and capability. Uh, there's no innovation happening in the Bangladesh leather industry. So we tend to get dictated to by the buyers. I was fascinated to hear you know, some of the presentations about the new Chrome 6 administration. I can tell you about an American Vice President of Sustainability who came to our tannery and said, in three years I don't want to see PH in this tannery. That's the level of ignorance that we do. Uh, no, no disrespect to my American friends, but um, it's, it's ridiculous. They don't know what they're talking about. But they get away with it because they come to Bangladesh and they're the customer and we're the few poor people who make the crust. So, um, not to take away from our own uh, lackings, I think we need more responsible and consistent buyer behavior. Um, we're faced with this every day. You know, we're, we're getting the discussion about aging on Chrome 6, and we heard that how it's not really necessary, or it's not mandatory, and I, I completely agree with that. But every single customer uh, that we deal with, and we work with 110 footwear retailers across Europe, America, and Japan, have now said aging Chrome 6. Mandatory. So, you know, it's, it's difficult when you don't have bargaining power, and I look forward to the day when we do, it's a little difficult to actually, shall we say, push back. The technology, skill, and know how constraints. When I look at the kind of research that's being done here by Leticia and amazing people like her, we lack this kind of know how. And I'm hoping that we can engage and partner with you to create this kind of capability. And last but not least, I really think the whole proprietor man. Mindset in Bangladesh is also a huge, huge challenge for the tannery industry. When we see the kind of amazing work that's being done at the SLG, uh, we lack corporate culture or corporate professionalism in our tannery sector. The company I work for is publicly traded. We have 8,000 shareholders, including international investment banks, hedge funds, and the largest government investment fund in Bangladesh. <coughs> we have, I believe, reasonably high standards of corporate governance. We have also very, very high uh, visibility with the customers that we work with, even down to supply chain traceability. And now, of course, then you have the new emerging issues. The whole ethical considerations of the ethical treatment of animals, is whether a byproduct or a waste product, chrome versus vegetable tan, high traceability and audit protocol. And I'm glad that John Hubbard talked about nickel in jewelry. I want to share with you a story about shoelaces. Slight digression, but I said you will give me the time. Uh, we export shoes to Germany, and we have to certify that the shoelaces that we use don't have nickel in the shoe tips, in the shoelace tips. And there was an Indian factory that they actually found this problem with. And not only did they not pay for the shoes, they forced the Indian factory to pay to burn the 13,000 pairs of shoes, thereby successfully bankrupting that factory. So. Uh, I think it was uh, War Warren who was talking about sustainability and profitability. I think we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of one and the other. Both are important, but unless you're profitable, it will be very hard to be success uh, sustainable in the future. Um, traceability is a big issue. Bangladesh, uh, the kind of material, kind of raw material, husbandry practices that we have. Again, there are cultural issues. I was discussing this with Ray. We are a predominantly Muslim country. And we don't have a lot of centralized abattoirs. And we have this festival that many of you know about called the Kurbani Festival, where animals are slaughtered as part of the religious uh, festival that we have. We can't stop that. But as long as we continue to do that, those are not ethically acceptable slaughtering practices. These are the kind of issues that we grapple with and we don't yet have the answers. So I, I think that we need to find the right solution for each country in its own state of development. And yes, definitely the need for appropriate technology, no matter what we do. There are many initiatives to go green from within the country. The, the central bank, the Bangladesh Bank, is already talking about certification by LEAN, for example. The European Union is supporting uh, eco-level initiatives and talking about providing soft financing for such. But all around, why should we believe that this time around, after 30 years, this relocation is finally going to happen? 
First and foremost, I think it's the environmental activism and consciousness within the country. It's not so much the pressure from outside, but the pressure from inside. Bangladesh is a very noisy and a very active democracy. We have a very active media. The days of dumping into the river are over. And the local community where you operate is extremely conscious of that. If you look at the new area, the MP, the councillors, and the people in that area view Ted with a lot of suspicion and with some justification. So they keep making sure that the government will actually do what they're promising to do. The second driver is real estate guarantees. Hazari Park today is worth much more as apartment buildings and flats than it is as families. So there is impetus also to move out. The compensation part is done. And the boys are putting a serious squeeze on supply chain traceability and RSL issues. The contractor has the domain experience of building and running large CTPs. And for this government, this would actually be a big political win. Many governments have come and gone and said, we would relocate as I want. This government actually has the opportunity to do it. And the industry ministry has gone on record of threatening to shut down the tanneries if the relocation doesn't happen. And last but not least, I really think we are victims of our own success to some extent. We are very much on the radar now. Uh, some of the major brands that you saw are already sourcing. And as they continue to put more and more emphasis on traceability, you will see the shift will happen. I'd like to share with you now a little video of the tech side. Bangladesh, a nation that promises great achievements in the years to come. Slowly, our potentials are being realized and accelerating development at an ever so fast rate. Bangladesh is an emerging economy but too dependent on the exports of ready-made garments. Leather offers a significant opportunity with both cheap labor and abundant raw materials. However, leather exports are being held back for one key reason. We are the biggest fish to exporter in the Italian and German shoe factory from Bangladesh. And last year, I lose our senior staff equivalent $9 million. And another German customer is a lawyer, which one they also basically got to try to cancel this order because of the number of facility in our country, which one we cannot provide. This is the main thing that we are losing our customer. Right now, while they are producing our little country, that one is a, a you know, the period of is 1940, the very small places, also close to the Dhaka city. This reason, we cannot make a particular plan that place. And this is why we are uh, discharging our water in the river, while it's also handling all the, you know, the local people's also water also suffering for this, the river also affected for this. This is also one of the biggest damage for us. The developing uh, environmental issues for them. Motors from the world have been complaining about it. Or notably, there is a sort of a negative aspect of this. You know, uh, lower energy industry is being in uh, uh, density of the area. So, what have to be? Previous attempts at the relocation failed 
because they did not contend with these binding constraints. For example, in 2003, an MOU was signed between the government and the leather associations, but neither party was fully invested in the relocation, resulting in a breakdown of the agreement. Pollution continuously expanded the focus of the reform to new players and issues, which raised the profile of the relocation and ensured public interest, creating pressure on both the government and industry. Construction of the CETP in Sabah is expected to be completed by mid 2015, meaning the Sabah estate may be operational by the end of the year. As the CETP takes shape, more than 100 tanneries have also begun construction of new factories in Sabah. The achievement of environmental compliance in Sabah will produce new opportunities for Bangladesh leather, including the new major markets such as the United States. And this will open up America as a huge market for Bangladesh leather exports, shoes and everything else. And I see the day when America, which produces some of the best heights in the world, will have a major export of raw leather to Bangladesh. It will be processed here in Sabar, made into shoes and finished leather goods, and then exported back to America. That is a win-win-win for everybody. I'm very proud of this. This is a message I've already been telling back in America. Just two weeks ago, I spoke with executives of major American uh, uh, shoe grinding, shoe uh, importers, and leather grinding importers, exporters of high exporters of chemicals, and people want to do business. So I'm telling this story. And Bangladesh needs to keep telling this story to open up the world to these exports.